Welcome back, folks. You are with the Vermont House Government Operations Committee. Uh, we are um, going to meet here for a little bit this morning, have some committee discussion about uh, S25. Um, I think it's helpful for us to uh, just sort of frame up the context in which we see this bill needing to move. And, um, and so, Rep. Gannon, if you have thoughts to uh, to help us frame up this conversation. I will uh, I will turn this over to you in a moment. But um, I think in particular, what uh, what is most important uh, to move in this bill are the pieces of the cannabis legislation that are necessary in order to uh, keep the program moving forward. Um, we've got some. Uh, some must pass sections that we have heard testimony on. Uh, and then we have a few other things that are very important, I think. Um, and we're going to try not to weigh down the bill with, um, with things that could wait to be done um, in January when the Cannabis Control Board is, is up and they have their executive director and their staff and they can uh, you know, sort of weigh back in with us um, on, uh, on the things that really, you know, that we had always envisioned would be done by the Cannabis Control Board. Um, and so, uh, Mr. Vice Chair, any other context setting that you think is helpful for us as we sort of discuss and filter what we're going to do with this bill? No, I think that capture it very well. Um, so um, because you are the keeper of the cannabis legislation, um, I thought I would let you go ahead and go through, you know, some of the the suggested changes that you uh, that you are working on, just based on what we've heard for committee testimony and what we know um, is going to be important, and and also in keeping with the direction of uh, of the original act. So. Um, uh, unless there are committee members who are dying to to ask a particular question, I think I'll go to Rep. Gannon now and uh, have him go through some of those changes. Nobody is diving for their hands, so go right ahead. Okay, so I'm going to just run through a, a list of proposed changes. Most of these have come up in testimony um, before our committee this week. Um, a couple um, uh, such as uh, Section 17 with respect to the Vermont Criminal Justice Training Council. Um, Sarah and I had a discussion um, with uh, the new executive director and Cindy Patch, and, and so I'll, I'll explain that discussion and, and why we need, need, need to make certain amendments um, uh, to uh, Section 17. Um, and so I'll just start. I'm going to try to go in order um, through the bill and. Then there are some uh, new sections that I think need to be added to the bill, and I will um, talk about those at the very end. Um, so the first proposed change is in section one on page one, um, which is eliminating uh, section 863, subsection three, which puts a date um, into which towns, if they have not voted, um, to add a retail store will be deemed to have um, agreed um, to allow retail. That is inconsistent with the original house position um, in the bill that we passed that is now Act 164. Um, and I have received, and I think the chair has received feedback from um, the Substance Misuse Prevention Oversight and Advisory Council um, who opposes this um, as well as prevention work. Works. Um, so I think there's a, now we heard from Gwen Zakov with VLCT um, that she would not be opposed to eliminating that subsection. Um, so that's the first proposed change. Any questions? Uh, I guess I should just invite folks um, as, we, as we ponder each of these recommended changes, um, if there are any questions or uh, or concerns, uh, we can talk about them as we go. Representative Anthony. Thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, thank you, John. 
Uh, just a procedural question. Do you want a thumbs up or something as we go uh, section by section uh, in terms of the, the, uh, the notion as John just did for section one, uh, recommending that that be eliminated or do you want to wait till the end? Because uh, I'm sort of mixing both reaction to each section and also mentally trying to figure out what is it that has to move right now as opposed to January. And I, 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 I'm trying to juggle those two ideas or, or filters as it were. Um, I think that we could probably um, to have just a little committee discussion on each item as we go through it. And if folks have um, worry or concern or disagreement with uh, anything that the vice chair lays out, we could certainly um, have that committee discussion. Uh, so, you know, I'm, I will call on people as they, uh, as they raise their hands and we can talk about each item as we go. We will, you know, when we see the language as drafted, then we will, um, we'll go through and actually drop hold the changes as we, as we go through the next draft of the bill. Right now, this can be just for committee discussion. Uh, Representative LaFave. Thank you. I just wanted to say that I did support what Representative Gannon uh, just overviewed. Okay, thanks. Any other conversation about the elimination? Representative LaFave. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I totally support this coming out. That was a major source of discussion in the conference committee. And it was also one of the concerns that the governor had expressed last time. All right, any other discussion on this? Onward. Um, so the next change is in section two on page two. Um, in section 843C4, um, um, I would propose to eliminate the advisory committee's removal authority of a member of the Cannabis Control Board. It would be highly, un we, this didn't come up in testimony, but it's something I, I noted, it would be highly unusual for an advisory committee to have the power um, to remove a member of the board that they advised. Um, I'm not sure of any other advisory, advisory committee that would have this power that's in law today. Um, so, uh, I mean, that, so I, it's just very odd that an advisory committee would have that power over a board. Representative LeClaire. Um, I have to agree with that as well, because if I recall the initial conversation around this was that this advisory committee, um, it's going to change over time as far as who's on it, depending on what the needs of the board are. So I do agree that an advisory um, committee having that sort of authority, just it doesn't fit. All right. Go right ahead. Okay. Um, the next change is in, also in section two on page three and is in section um, 843H, which is the members of the um, advisory committee. And I, I'm proposing adding um, two positions to that. Um, one would replace um, one of the positions that's listed and the other would be a new position. So the, the new position would be the chair of the Cannabis for Symptom Relief Oversight Committee or designee. Um, I think we heard testimony this morning um, about the need to have um, that, that person or their designee um, on, on the, the advisory committee. And I think also um, James Pepper testified um, with respect to that. And I think um, along those lines, I, I want to um, I want to have just a brief acknowledgement that there are probably um, common sense reforms that need to be made to the uh, Cannabis for Symptom Relief Program. Um, but that is, uh, you know, that is something that that's a program that was uh, created and designed uh, by the 
Human Services Committee, and it, it is more closely in alignment with their area of jurisdiction in terms of human services related issues. Um, and so while I found it fairly compelling, this notion that, um, that in addition to putting um, folks from that realm onto the advisory committee, there ought to also be uh, some changes that are made. Um, I, I think they need to be done not in May, <laughs> you know, in the form of a bill that, uh, you know, that is only going to get, uh, you know, a week and a half or two weeks of, of um, you know, consideration from here on out, um, but that we, uh, you know, invite folks or offer to help folks um, introduce a bill that the Human Services Committee could uh, consider in more depth. I, I mean, personally, I, I, I don't know enough about the science of, um, of cannabis for uh, substance misuse um, treatment, and, but I, uh, you know, but I think the Human Services Committee probably has some, uh, some more deep expertise and knowledge in how to navigate that area. So I just, while I found it compelling, I don't think the, the place for some of the other things that we heard this morning is necessarily in this bill. Committee discussion? Um, in terms of changing who or how people make it onto this over oh, advisory committee, oversight committee, I'm, I, I want to make sure I get the language right. Um, I do think that the individual representing criminal justice reform, I know TJ has been great on criminal justice reform, but we can't guarantee that that will always be the case with the attorney general. And so I would still advocate that that be appointed by the ACLU rather than the attorney general. Committee discussion on that? Feel free to unmute for committee discussion since I've got some folks in line for other conversation. So I guess in particular, what, which, where would that be replaced? Is there a- There is a, a, an appointee to represent criminal justice reform to be appointed by the attorney general. Maybe I'm in the wrong part of the bill, but- Okay, I, no, I, no, you're I in the right part. Okay. Committee discussion about the appointing authority for that person, that individual on the advisory committee. <clears throat> Go ahead, Bob. Uh, you know, quite frankly, if we're looking for diversity of perspective, uh, it's not a bad idea. I would support it. Anyone else want to weigh in on this? I just have a question around that. Was, was that part of a conversation this morning that I wasn't a part of, or is this just a? No, it was I a think... conversation with James Pepper. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. If if I remember correctly, there is a working group uh, composed, um, uh, and Representative Grad would would know better, who's been working on. Uh, the whole juvenile justice reform and all the rest of that. That's a much wider group. It does include the ACLU. It does include some state's attorney. Um, I'm, I'm not sure that that group would be a more suitable arena from which a representative could be chosen. I don't want to make this too complicated, but the ACLU has a, has a very particular perspective on this. I'm just reflecting on the fact that all along the way, the Judicial Committee here in the House has been accessing uh, that group, which is more multifaceted, uh, to, to uh, bounce ideas about judicial reform off. And I just throw that out as a, as a wider spectrum of folks. It does include the age, a representative from AG, uh, uh, as I say, state's attorney, ACLU, um, and I'm not sure, I can't remember who else, but Maxine could tell you in a moment. Uh, representative Grad, who that, what that group is composed of. Other committee discussion on this point? <clears throat> Go ahead, Rep. Blair. Okay. Um, 
So basically we're talking about position K here, right? One member with expertise in criminal justice reform appointed by the attorney general. Is that basically what we're talking about? Um, I'm just throwing this out for discussion, I guess, in that my understanding is the original intent of these folks is they bring a particular area of expertise to the discussion. And I'm just wondering the ACLU, do they bring that particular expertise to the discussion that is now being referred to? And I guess I'll throw it in there is I, 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 I don't want this to get politicized. And, you know, are people agenda driven as opposed to expertise driven? And that's just a question more than anything. Second comment. I, I can too, but go ahead, Bob. <laughs> uh, well, uh, Rob's point is, is worthy of consideration, but as you look down the list of the people that are doing the appointing, um, it's, it's all political people. So you're going to have a political agenda. I don't necessarily fear. I mean, the, the, the role of this group is to bring diversity of opinion and thought forward. So bringing somebody in from outside the realm of government might not be a bad idea. And whether it's Peter's comment about a, an existing group or uh, Tanya's about a particular agent, uh, I don't, I mean, I don't know how much regulatory compliance the treasurer has as far as a, an agency of government as opposed to people that actually do regulatory work. It's... Al. Rep. Colson, are you wanting to jump in on this one? Oh, not or, on this right one. Ahead. Okay. I, I have another point. I'm That's happy to weigh in on why I chose the ACLU and it is because their mission is really around criminal justice reform and that's what we're talking about here. It isn't as political because it's not an elected seat like the attorney general and they are comprised of lawyers as is the attorney general. So it was me trying to sort of move out of the elected office space to a, to a group that's mission is criminal justice reform but is also primarily composed of lawyers. So my hope was to bring the expertise without that. So I was actually trying to Talk, speak to some of the concerns you raise about the politicization. Anyone else on this question? I like Tanya's idea, frankly. Um, and I'm sorry, I can't tick off the, the members of the group I was thinking of, but clearly ACLU comes at this with a perspective, but not, not a party-based political position. Thanks. Claire, are you on this or? Uh, yes, ma'am. Um, there, there really isn't anything in this language that would uh, prevent the AG from, uh, I guess, appointing them to this, is there? I'm not suggesting the ACLU be appointed. I'm suggesting they be the appointing authority. Ah, okay, okay. Anyone else on this? All right, well, I'm, I, since we'll have a little more discussion about it, um, uh, Rip Colston. Uh, thanks, Madam Chair. Um, you know, the, the, the testimony this morning was, was important to me in, in, in different ways, but one of, the, one of the concerns that it raised for me is just the lack of knowledge about cannabis by, so many of our healthcare providers. And um, I don't know if this is the appropriate time to consider or in January, but it would seem to me somebody with healthcare provider expertise would be an important voice. And, and maybe it's, it's, it's a backdoor way to, to, to bring up the educational level of what this is really about. Um, so I, I just see that as a gap right now, not having um, that kind of voice and, and diversity and thought for this committee. Mm 
Uh, go ahead, Rep. Gannon. So we, we may want to hold off on the discussion until we discuss the Cannabis for Symptom Relief Oversight Committee, um, because one of my proposed amendments is, is that that, that committee was going to was re repealed in Act 164 of March 1st of 2022. Um, and the recommendation from James Pepper, and I, I think we heard from people today, was to keep that committee alive. And I think um, that if we do, we can look at the makeup of that committee because um, I, I think and we can discuss that in a moment because I think th there could be some changes to the makeup that, of the committee that would address Representative Colson's concerns. That sounds great. All right. Uh, Rep. Tuchowski, your hand is still up. Um, yeah, I wanted to ask about um, some more, just thinking about some ra additional racial justice representation on this committee. Okay. Do you have a uh, recommendation? I have a lot, but I, so I'm also trying to think of sort of the balance because it sounds like, and, and I'm trying to wrap my mind around this because it's move, it's been moving quickly. But there are sort of two different committees that we're talk that I've heard talked about. One being this sort of larger social equity committee, and this committee, and I'm just trying to, I don't, I don't know. No, I don't have any specific recommendations. Uh, Representative Hooper. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Two questions. Uh, is the Vice Chair proposing that item H uh, be the existing language plus uh, somebody from the medical community? Yeah, I was suggesting we add a new position, um, which was the chair of the Cannabis for Symptom Relief Oversight Committee, or their designee. Okay, so, and uh, following up on some of what Rep Higley uh, brought up and conversations subsequent to that, um, I, I think maybe we might wanna look at tightening up since this is probably the only person that's gonna have this expertise, item C. Uh, to be somebody with some pretty in-depth knowledge, laboratory science, I don't know what that is. Toxicology is a, uh, a valid sort of thing, but we're basically talking about the, the cusp of chemical engineering here when we get into changing the structure of stuff. So I would hope that we uh, make sure that somebody is on this advisory board that has background in that type of area. It's going to be new frontier stuff. Well, th there is that position C, which yeah. does have that experience. And I think the reason we have that person on the advisory committee is one of the licensees is a testing lab. Um, and the cannabis control board has to write rules and regulations around testing. Yeah, and I, what I specifically was trying to say, John, is toxicology is a good thing. I don't know what laboratory science means in terms of qualification. Uh, so I'd say tightening that language up to be something more specific to that field of knowledge would be comforting. Thank you. Is that, is that perhaps okay. intended to reflect a cannabis-informed uh, pharmac pharmacological, pharmatological expertise, because really what you're talking about is a, a person who understands the formulation, if you will, of uh, compounds that include cannabis, or am I off base? Well, that and specifically to what Mark was talking about with the conversion of an eight to a nine. That, oh, right. That's a derivative process of changing molecular structure to some degree, and that's well over a lot of heads, I suspect. We have well, Ledge Council respect with it. us now, so okay. let's uh, let's see if Ledge Council can put some context in this. Hi, everyone. Um, so when you created that language last year, um, uh, you were basing it on, I think, what, what the uh, vice chair already mentioned. Um, so laboratory sciences um, is, a bio, is a biology chemistry based kind of line of education that uh, that focuses on uh, lab work, clinics, forensic labs, 
research labs, things like that. So at the time that was the, I mean, I think it still captures exactly what you're looking for here with regard to somebody being able to represent that, that particular field. So unless you're looking at that position going in a different direction, I think the existing language addresses it. Okay. Next hand I see is Representative Anthony. Uh, just to do uh, comment from the testimony this morning, I, I take away that part of the worries was uh, the, the testing for, uh, pardon the phrase impurities, but, but uh, ancillary elements or compounds that are unwanted. Does that phrase laboratory um, science testing that capture that in, in Michelle or whoever's opinion, because uh, that it's the purity issue that came up this morning uh, of un unwanted ingredients being there and being not known to be there. It encompasses all of it because there's there's a number of issues that relate to the um, you know the biology and science of all of this, whether it's testing for contaminants, testing for THC levels, for uh, requirements around labeling, um, all of that kind of stuff. So that's just a broad category. The governor has broad discretion at who to appoint there. So I, I, I respectfully, I think that you, you, you're getting too much into the yeah. gritty there. I think I would recommend that we not try to rewrite um, the whole advisory council, that if we have heard, uh, if we've heard something that's compelling about adding a perspective, um, that is, uh, that is something that we should discuss and um, decide whether to move forward on, but let's not do too much in the way of rewriting the bill that we just passed into law a few months ago. Uh, Representative LeClaire. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> I'm just, if I remember correctly, isn't there underlying language in, what is it, Act 164, where the Cannabis Control Board can, they have the, off, the ability to go get more or different expertise that maybe isn't spelled out in this group already. They aren't limited just to this group. Isn't that correct? I, I think that's helpful framing of the way we were discussing this when we, uh, when we passed the original act. And that is that we, we were hearing from a number of perspectives that we wanted the, this cannabis control board that none of us could envision or knew Um, you know, what it would look like. We wanted them to have certain um, perspectives that, that were uh, appointed and, and asked to come together an advisory committee, but that certainly doesn't limit the Cannabis Control Board from seeking out any other expertise or information they might need from other perspectives. Right, because I have a tendency to agree with my friend from Minuski. I do think that the medical perspective um, would be very appropriate. Um, however, whether it's in this form or another one, but I just again, wanted to reiterate that I'm pretty sure that the intent was is the Cannabis Control Board will have access to basically any and all resources they need to come up with the, the promulgate the rules going forward. Rep. Hopsky. I gave a little more thought to your question about specific racial justice um, representation. And I wonder if adding a seat for the racial justice executive director or asking them to be the appointing body on item D, which is one member with an expertise in systemic social justice and equity issues appointed by the Speaker of the House currently. Um, and while I agree that the, the council can seek opinions from anywhere, having a seat at the table is different than the table, than being brought the table if the council sees fit. Go ahead, Rep. Gannon. <laughs> So um, another proposed amendment I have, which is in the social equity section, is to actually have, and this was suggested by ACCD yesterday in testimony, was that adding the, um, the executive director of the racial equity um, to um, the group that will be setting up the social equity program and uh, creating the criteria 
by that. So um, she would be part of that process um, in, in the proposed amendment that I'm, that I'm making. And that was suggested by ACCD. So with respect to the social equity program, we would have the Cannabis Control Board in consultation with the advisory committee, ACCD, and the executive director of racial equity, um, part of that process of creating the social equity program. Uh, um, do, and will the social equity program have weigh in on the actual rules? Because those are different things. Yes, they will set up the criteria for application to that program. But they don't have oversight into the larger over into the larger discussion around cannabis rules that the advisory council does or the oversight council. That would be correct. Okay. Other discussion on this? Back to you, Mr. Vice Chair. Okay. Um, so I am suggesting that we replace um, a position, which is F, which now currently reads one member with expertise in substance misuse prevention appointed by the Senate Committee on Committees and replacing that with the, the chair of the Substance Misuse Prevention Oversight and Advisory Council or designee. Since there's already a council set up to do that and they've been, they have provided us with guidance and requested this position, um, that that be added. Seems and, like a good link. Yep, and because that sets up an imbalance between who the Senate appoints and who the House appoints, thank Michelle pointed out to me, is that we probably um, should change um, I, which is one member with expertise in municipal, municipal issues, instead of having that person appointed by the treasurer it should be appointed by the Senate Committee on Committees, just to keep the balance between the House and the Senate. Well, we're always correcting the stuff that the Senate doesn't get right anyway. I mean, <laughs> no sense <comment>. of humor. <laughs> now, now, remember you're you're uh, on YouTube hey. in perpetuity. You don't want to start a, a huffy dialogue between the two <laughs> bodies. They, see it. It. they already started it. <laughs> and I said it with a smile. I know. We we know you were just Josh and uh, Rep. Dehoski. I'm curious why the member with expertise in municipal issues wouldn't be appointed by the Vermont League of Cities and Towns. Because we needed equal appointments from the House and the Senate. So that takes me back to the systemic social justice and equity per issue person being not appointed by the speaker, but appointed by the office of racial or equity. I'm getting that office name wrong. I know that I am. I think when we were envisioning this um, back when we wrote, when we first wrote the bill, um, I think the conversation was around um, the fact that the legislature has created a social equity caucus and that that social equity caucus is, um, is weighing in and having influence on uh, in a number of different places and that we, uh, we wanted the speaker to be able to um, consult with uh, the social equity caucus in the legislature to, uh, to, to use their expertise in helping to find someone to appoint to this advisory committee. Hal's nodding his head. Rep Colston, is that is that the way you were recalling it as well? I I it's been a year or two. Yes, and and um, we 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 have an ongoing relationship with the speaker in, in regards to providing that kind of advice. Um, I guess I don't have any questions around that. I just uh, maybe would like a little more information of why, why they would reach out to, in particular, the Social Equity Caucus and not the um, Social Equity um, Director, in, in a sense. In, in the state. I mean, 
Um, can, can somebody explain to me more about that? Well, the, the Racial Equity Office is an office within the Agency of Administration. Um, and while I'm sure that there's a lot of collaboration between the Social Equity Caucus and the Speaker's Office and the Director of Racial Equity, um, I, I don't expect that they would be at odds with each other um, on any of that. Um, but we did want to you know, make sure that the speaker had the opportunity to uh, collaborate with our social equity caucus on this. Rep. Colson? Yes, I just wanted to add, uh, thank you, Madam Chair, that the social equity caucus is, is really um, uh, represents a, a broad sense of voices. Um, about 75 of our members are legislators. Most of them are representatives, but we have senators. We have a senator who co-chairs it as well. Um, so, and then in addition to that, we have about 75 community members from around the state who participate in the Social Equity Caucus. So we, we have uh, many voices, but we have perspectives and um, we have a vision of, of what social equity might look like for our government. So. I think its its role in this is an important one in terms of uh, representing the many, many voices that are working towards social equity and um, racial justice. Rep. Vihoski? Yeah, I, I really appreciate that sort of background and just looking at the appointing body is it if we're worried about the this being very political, it feels like there are a lot of appointees coming from political bodies. And so the places that we might be able to, to hand those out to community organizations and group organizations to bring other voices to the table that might not be engaged as much in the political process, I think is important if we're really going to get that diverse set of voices. Other committee discussion on this? We will uh, go ahead, Rep. Leclerc. Okay, I'm so I'm sorry, I lost a little track. So which which one are we talking here about replacing or changing? D, which is one member with an expertise in systemic social justice okay. equity issues. And and so I guess I'm just I have to ask the 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 obvious question is, do we have examples where we have a caucus listed as the appointing authority in, in anything? No. No, no this is the speaker making the appointment. Yeah. The, the right. debate is whether okay. the speaker or some other entity should make the appointment. And, okay. and, and I think as, as Representative Colston explained is, you know, the, the Social Equity Caucus um, consults with the speaker on a regular basis. And it's not just made up of, of members of the legislature, um, but uh, of groups um, that, that have been impacted um, by um, systemic racism. So I, I think, you know, they, they would be a good um, uh, group to listen to, that the speaker should listen to in making that appointment. I mean, and that okay. is a very diverse group of people. Yeah, I know. I'm, not, I'm sorry. I was reading ahead a little bit earlier. So, but is there anything about the current language that would uh, prevent her from doing that? No. Oh, okay. All right. Okay. <laughs> sorry. I, I, I'll do my homework better next time. Uh, Rep. Hovsky. Yeah, and and I hear that there are people other than legislators on the Social Equity Caucus. I I I am on the Social Equity Caucus. I certainly know that. My concern is that people who have systemically been harmed often don't engage with the legislative process and, and with these official processes because they've been harmed by these processes. And I wanna make sure their voices are coming to the table. And so it's not simply that it's only legislators, it's that in all likelihood, a lot of the voices we wanna hear from aren't going to come to the Social Equity Caucus because there's a mistrust in, in the larger systems. And I just wanna make sure that we're being really thoughtful about making sure we're including even the voices of people who don't come to those spaces. Representative Colston. Oh, thank you, Madam Chair. Well, um, 
I, I would beg to differ with that characterization. I think one of the unique things about the caucus is that we have attracted those voices in, in, in a very participatory process. Uh, we set up a social equity caucus work group that um, weighed in on um, our policies with regards to social equity. Um, and those were voices that were, were never at the table before. So we, we go out of our way to make sure that we're different. Thank you. Representative Hooper. Um, not this particular talk, Madam Chair. Unless we're ready to transition. Um, I think we probably are. I think we will um, have an opportunity to have this discussion again when we have the uh, the final bill language in front of us. So um, let's go ahead and shift gears. Um, please, please don't tell me you're going to open up another <laughs> another one of the members of the advisory committee to suggest we change the appointing authority. <laughs> We've got quite a quite a bit more to go over here, folks. Um, no, I'm asking for a little background on how M ended up here because their perspective seems to be, uh, you know, promotion or agenda driven, where everybody else on the list seems to be sort of advisory, actually, from expertise. So for uh, those following along at home, do you want to tell us what M yeah. is? One member appointed by the Vermont Cannabis Trade Association. Do we know what caused the Senate to want that on there? Uh, Ledge Council probably remembers that discussing. Thank you, Michelle. So that was added by uh, Senate Government Operations Committee and uh, that association, those are the dispensaries. And so they wanted to have the dispensaries be a part of the, of the discussion. Thank, thank you. Mm -hmm. Onward, Mr. Vice Chair. <laughs> okay, so I'm um, moving off of the advisory committee now. So, um, and moving to section 12. Page 23 of the bill. And um, which deals with um, the social equity program. And so um, it, currently, it, it, this is, I'm looking at section, um, subsection C. Um, the fund shall be used for the following purposes, and I'm going to list the existing purposes to provide low interest rate loans and grants for, to social equity applicants to pay for ordinary and necessary expenses to start and operate a licensed cannabis establishment. Two, to pay for outreach that may be provided or targeted to attract and support social equity applicants. And three, necessary costs incurred in administering the fund. Um, Representative Colston suggested adding a, a fourth item. Um, which would be to add to assist with job training and technical assistance for social equity applicants. Any discussion on that? Yeah, could uh, um, go ahead, Representative Rep. Gannon. Could you could you give me the the section again on that? I lost you a little bit. Okay, so we're on page 23. Um, and in subsection C, where it says, the, which is about a third of the way down on the page, the fund shall be used for the following purposes. This is the social, the cannabis, hold on, let me get the official name for it, it is the Cannabis Business Development Fund. So this will be used for loan, I mean, the primary use is for loans and grants to social equity applicants, um, but it establishes several other things that that fund can be used for. And so I read off the three that are in the bill and I was suggesting um, as Representative Colson asked us to do is to add a fourth item that the fund could be used for, which is for um, job training and technical assistance to social equity applicants. So I don't know if this is the place for this. I think uh, you had mentioned it or someone had mentioned it not too long ago, but who's gonna come up with the definition of a social equity applicant? 
Um, so I'm getting to that, um, but that the definition would be, uh, that's in section 13, um, but it would be the Cannabis Control Board in consultation with the advisory committee, ACCD, who's gonna be running this loan and grant program, and the executive director of racial equity. Okay, thanks. And ACCD asked um, to be able to be a part of that because they need to be able to say, yes, we can, you know, yes, that definition is something we understand and know how to work with um, because they'll be administering it. Representative LeClaire. Um, I'm actually, I think, support that language in that it would make sense that if we're going to head down this path that we want to give these folks all the tools that we can give them to make them successful. Um, I don't know if there's any guardrails. I, I don't want somebody to think they're gonna walk out of this with a four-year degree though. An MBA? That's not, that's not what you were thinking this would be for. <laughs> No, but it does make sense to, to give them as many tools as we give them so that they have a high feasibility of success. Yes. Representative Anthony. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I agree uh, totally with Hal's uh, addition. You may recall yesterday I quizzed our uh, uh, board chair about um, assistance for folks who um, are no longer applicants. They actually have a license and they're starting a business. And they may be new at that. And I just want to be sure, maybe it's later in uh, Rep Gannon's uh, iteration of going through, but I want to be sure that the uh, support, education, consultation, et cetera, is available, not just for people who are applicants, but people who are awardees. Now, again, maybe that occurs later in the bill, but this language seems to stop uh, with the uh, status of somebody simply being an applicant. I don't object to it. I just want to be sure that that assistant uh, carries on to the awardee. Back to you, Rep. Gannon. Okay. Um, so the next change is also in section 12 on pages 22 and 23. Um, and this is the, the language that ACCD um, proposed yesterday. Um, and I will read it, which is, um, it's in section 988, social equity loans and grants. Um, and this deals with the issue that ACC testified about that they cannot um, directly provide loans. Um, so the language they proposed yesterday was the agency may procure by contract all or part of the necessary underwriting, execution, and administration services required for loans and grants to be made from the Cannabis Business Development Fund to eligible social equity applicants as allowed under this chapter. Should the agency be unable to do so, the program shall not move forward until the legislature appropriates the operational resources necessary for ACCD to make loans and provide financial assistance to social equity applicants. Rep. Leclerc, I think that's from before. So Rep. Mihovsky. My Mine was actually to the previous point um, and the larger look, but I would love to see language included in this section around making a study or a report that really looks at the participation of m communities that have been marginalized, you know, minorities, women, people with disabilities, um, people who have been incarcerated and that having that report really include what barriers remain. I don't want us to implement something and say we did it and it works, but never have the mechanism to go back and look at it and see if it truly is working and what needs to be done to make it work better, if that makes sense. Representative LeClaire. I apologize. Um, could we go back to the, the section? The member from Barry's just made me think about something as far as the, the support goes. Um, uh, along with the member from Winooski's recommendation, are, are, are we talking about providing the support to people who 
are applying or people who have actually been um, awarded? The, the language I reference refers to applicants um, for technical assistance. Um, so, but I think it's important that people who are, are thinking about applying for a social equity loan and grant uh, be provided technical assistance so they're in a position to succeed um, in the process. I mean, if we do it after someone is awarded the money, um, it, that may not be as successful. I mean, also it's part of encouraging people to participate in this process is providing them with the technical assistance to do so. So, but is the technical assistance, is it contemplated to help them in the application process or after the fact? I, I think it's to assist them with the process, but also with standing up a cannabis establishment, whether that's a retail business, um, a, a cultivator or a manufacturer, it's to provide them with the experience so that they can be successful once they receive a grant or a loan. Okay. I, I guess I understand the intent. My concern is, is does that mean that, is it so open-ended that everybody who um, either wants to apply or does apply that we're going to offer them all that type and level of technical assistance. I'm not sure that was the intent, but maybe. Well, I, I think that anybody that wants it should get it. I, I mean, because, you know, part of the whole purpose of the social equity section of S25 is to encourage people who have been disproportionately harmed by um, marijuana p prohibition um, to be able to access and you know, open a business um, in the legal cannabis marketplace. Okay, so that would be the limiting factor then as far as who gets that. Okay, got it, thank you. Brett McCarthy. I just wanted to voice some support for Representative Gannon's proposal about technical assistance and it harkens back to the numbers and the reports that we heard around um, small businesses and the economic recovery grants, for instance, right? Like a different area, obviously, but when we think about some of the, the, the businesses that had opportunity to get technical assistance with writing grants had much more success applying. I think about like women-owned businesses had Vermont Works for Women and they could get that technical assistance and there was a path for them, even if they weren't the best grant writers in the world to be able to get those grants and get that support. And similarly here, we're trying to create the ability to use these funds to help these social equity applicants get, have success, not only just in implying from what Representative Gannon said, but also in sort of managing their grants. I mean, it does, somebody might be really great as a cannabis business owner, but not be the best grant writer or the best applicant here. And, and that's the problem I think we're trying to solve. All right, Rep Gannon, back to you. Okay, um, so the next proposed change is in section 13, which is on page 24 of S25. Um, and this is, uh, deals with um, developing the criteria for social equity applicants. And so the proposed change I made, which was also recommended or, or suggested by ACCD is, is that the Cannabis Control Board in consultation with the Advisory Committee, ACCD, and the Executive Director of Racial Equity shall de develop criteria for social equity applicants for the purposes of obtaining social equity loans and grants from the Cannabis Business Development Fund, pursuant to 7 VSA Chapter 39. And I should note the next sentence, the board shall provide that criteria to the General Assembly no later than October 15, 2021. So we get a chance to review it too. All right, onward. All right, so then we're going to move to 
section 15, um, which is also um, on page 24. And we heard testimony about this issue um, this morning, um, which is uh, the date when the um, medical cannabis registry was transferred from the Department of Public Safety to the Cannabis Control Board. Um, the proposed change is that that transfer shall not occur until January 1st, 2022, which I think what we heard this morning was they urged us to delay that transfer from uh, what the Senate had, which was on July 1st, 2021. I believe we all heard that and felt that was reasonable. Okay, so the next change is on page 25, and this is section 17. Section 17 requires the Vermont Criminal Justice Council to report to the Joint Legislative Justice Oversight Committee regarding the funding for the requirement that on or before December 31st, 2021, all law enforcement officers receive a min minimum of 16 hours of advanced roadside impaired driving enforcement training as required by Act 164. So um, the chair and I met with um, the new executive director of the Vermont Criminal Justice Council yesterday and Cindy Patch, who is the um, training coordinator. Um, and we had a great, a great discussion about this thing and they raised a number of issues um, is that really um, there is a thousand law enforcement officers that need a ride aid ride ugh, a ride training and that in order to do that successfully um, it would take five years actually to train all those people um, they could hire additional people um, at a cost of somewhere between 75 and a hundred thousand dollars to train people, but their concern with doing that um, was that um, defense counsel um, may question so many people coming on board in the ARI program so quickly um, that they're not actually adequately trained. So they did have concerns um, that rushing into this um, would, um, would lead to legal problems in court. Um, and I, also deleted the reference to 16 hours based on their, our discussions with them because the program may change. Um, there may be additional hours or there may be less hours, um, but you know, A-Ride is a national program. Um, and so the certification, it, it, they're just gonna offer the training that's consistent with the A-Ride certification. And so they did request that we just eliminate the 16 hour reference. And so what I am suggesting is we delete section 17, um, but amend 20 BSA section 23584, um, which does mandate this training. And so that language would be on or before December 31st, 2026, law enforcement officers shall receive the training required by this section. So it just extends the date and eliminates the 16 hour 16, uh, 16 hour reference. Representative Anthony. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Rep Gannon, I don't, I don't mean to go back, but the other thing I heard, this is to moving the date <clears throat> uh, ahead um, uh, back to January 1 um, of when the, uh, I guess the cannabis board uh, takes over the medical uh, marijuana system. As I recall this morning, there was a discussion and a plea by both of our um, testifiers about the um, fund that is so, sort of undergirds the medical marijuana system and that that collapsing of that fund into uh, the, the, the merged system also be postponed. Is Was that automatically implied in the um, yeah. in the amendment that you articulated? Yes, because the Cannabis Control Board would not have um, control over the medical um, dispensary okay. program until January 1st, 2022, um, they wouldn't have access to those funds. So the money moves? Not money, to money moves with the program. Okay, fantastic, thanks. 
Right. So I have two additional changes which are not in the bill. Um, and the, the first one, um, which is, is to retain the cannabis for symptom relief oversight committee, um, that is repealed in Act 164. So the proposal is to maintain that. So now, and this would, you know, it'd be helpful to have a discussion on this um, because Michelle and I, Michelle Taylor and I had a, a brief discussion about the makeup uh, of the, this committee. And so I'm gonna read the current makeup um, and, and, and you know, share with you the discussion um, I had with Michelle about this. So the current medical oversight committee's composition is made up of the following people. One registered patient appointed by each dispensary. One registered nurse and one registered patient, patient appointed by the governor. One physician appointed by the Vermont Medical Society. One member of a local zone, zoning board appointed by the Vermont League of Cities and Towns. One representative appointed jointly by the Vermont Sheriff's Association and the Vermont Association of Chiefs of Police. And finally, the Commissioner of Public Safety or his or her designee. Now, the, the discussion I had with um, Legislative Council questioned why we needed so much law enforcement on this oversight committee. Um, now, with respect to the Commissioner of Public Safety, um, he manages this program, but as we know, this is gonna shift to the Cannabis Control Board. So one thought is to add the chair of the Cannabis Control Board to the Oversight Committee or his or her designee. Um, and then I am baffled as to why there is a local zoning board person on this committee. It just does not make sense to me. And I, I don't know how other members of the committee feel, but that is, and I, I understand that perhaps when we were initially standing up the medical program that there was concern, law enforcement concerns, but I'm really not sure we need that other law enforcement person on there. So, um, so one of the things that I suggested is perhaps we wanna have a registered caregiver on the committee because that group is not represented, but we did hear some testimony this morning um, about the importance of caregivers. So, um, and I really haven't come up with a replacement for um, the zoning person. <laughs> so any thoughts on that would be helpful. Representative Anthony. Yes, I, I, I too was moved this morning by the uh, testimony, which essentially my takeaway was, this is a very rare uh, or unusually situated person, whether on the caregiver side or the um, uh, uh, medical advising side with a person who is thoroughly familiar with cannabis as a treatment. And so I'm wondering, uh, in addition to the caretaker, a, see our caregiver, whether or not the um, uh, nominee from <clears throat> cannabis dispensary should be required to have some uh, expertise, as we heard this morning, uh, in the clinical uh, or um, um, uh, treatment side of a cannabis regime. Because notice the way the language is now, it's sort of wide open. Uh, there's no criteria beyond uh, not by, uh, by uh, a cannabis uh, registry. Uh, and it seems to me that that's, that's an expertise that we heard this morning, in addition to caregiver, that is very specialized and quite rare. Rep Behovsky. I wanted to also speak in support of adding a caregiver here and share the vice chair's um, confusion as to why there is a member of the zoning board that, yep, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know why either, but yes, I, I would 100% support adding that caregiving perspective. I think it's incredibly important. And we know that from from throughout history, our, our best things are created when we we include the voices most impacted. And I heard very clearly this morning that that was that was a big oversight. So thank you for for adding that. Rep. Leclerc. Um, 
I, I unfortunately was not here for the this morning's discussion, but um, I would advocate for either changing the nurse's position or the member of the what zoning commission to an APRN, a nurse practitioner. And the reason that I say that is they are they have prescriptive rights in Vermont, and as we all know, there's a lot of different interactions with drugs and i suspect that as we move forward here and this becomes more prevalent that those that are dealing with this have a, a thorough understanding of of the interaction between whether it be you know smoking it ingesting it um tinctures salves whatever i i would want to get as much expertise i think there as we could Rep. Hooper. I, I sort of was following along what Rob's conversation was, but I was leaning more towards somebody from the pharmacy world, uh, very deep in uh, all aspects of pharmacology and other things. Not that I would discount Rob's suggestion, but uh, that sort of advances it a little bit higher. Thank you. I could actually support that, that we need the expertise. All right, John, back to you. Um, those were all of my proposed changes, Madam Chair. All right, so we probably have a draft um, in its final stages that would reflect these changes. Um, I think that's why Ledge Council dropped off the meeting since we seem to be doing a fine job of navigating our way through. Um, so if there are other areas that folks would like to discuss before we break for lunch, I will then contact Ledge Council and ask her to um, send the draft to each of us in our email and get it posted to our committee page so that we can hopefully review the language um, maybe during floor debate and then, uh, and then come back to look at the language again uh, after the floor. So Rep Gannon. Um, I failed to mention one other change that, that that I proposed, which is this is based on James Pepper's testimony, requesting two positions to the Cannabis Control Board, a general counsel and an administrative support position. Um, but I think we're still working with James on that language. And and I in communication with him, um, the he believes that this is all. Um, within the appropriation that's already um, been designated for the Cannabis Control Board. So he doesn't need any new appropriation for it. Um, and that he simply wants to make sure that he has the authorization to actually hire the individuals that they need. Rep. Anthony. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> uh, do <clears throat> either of you know if what we just reviewed uh, is inclusive of the list uh, that really has to get going and, and anything that has not been talked about this morning will await January. Is, is that the implication I take away? I think what Rep Gannon was going through was the changes that he asked Ledge Council to make. And so um, I don't know that that necessarily looks with a strict lens to strip out anything that Ha that that doesn't have that must pass, but um, but it does get us to the point where we're taking out the things that are um, either more controversial or um, uh, problematic. And Representative Gannon has now disappeared. So uh, there he is in the waiting room. Excellent. Welcome back, Mr. Vice Chair. Sorry you got booted. 
that's one thing I'm not going to miss when we're back in person in the building is the ability for someone to get plucked out of the meeting and dropped off into their own little space and then have to rush to get back. Uh, so, uh, Rep. Gannon, did you hear what what Rep. Anthony said, and did, did you have anything you wanted to respond to that? I, I did not hear it, Madam Chair. Um, he was just asking about whether the new draft we're going to see has eliminated everything that is not must pass, and and I was saying that uh, that you've gone through each of the changes that um, that you've asked Leg Council to draft for us, and that. It doesn't necessarily pass the strict, these things have to pass, um, but but this list is inclusive of, of what we heard for testimony about things that are relatively straightforward and non-controversial. that sound accurate? I feel like he's about to be plucked and dumped out of the meeting again. <laughs> All right, uh, Representative Hooper, and we'll come back to Mr. Vice Chair if we unfreeze him. Yeah. yeah. Um, I realize I'm about to say a bridge too far, but I was particularly taken by the impact of the plant limit. And I realize that'll probably be a January thing, but it also seems to really have a financial impact on people that are really needing this service. So I would hope we. Uh, either advance that or put it high on an agenda somewhere. So my my supposition is that that would cross over into the Human Services Committee realm and that that would be something that, um, that might trigger uh, a bill being introduced that would head in that direction since they designed and created the program and um, may wanna have some influence on uh, changes to the program. I'm, I'm like dismayed that the cost factor of this went completely over my head when we were talking about this S54 wise and stuff. We Comment. weren't looking at the medical system because that's not in our jurisdiction. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. Anybody uh, have any other questions? All right, so Representative Gannon appears to be frozen still. I wonder if we can turn his camera off. Hold on, I'm stopping your video to see if that gets you unfrozen. Can you talk now? Can you hear me? Yes, we can. <laughs> oh, okay. I, I forgot to mention two new reporting requirements. Um, this is based on the testimony we heard tomorrow after yesterday afternoon. Um, one is, um, to have the Cannabis Control Board on or before January 15, 2022, um, make recommendations as to whether integrated licensees and manufacturer licensees can produce solid concentrate products with greater than 60% THC for purposes of incorporation into other cannabis products, which other products comply with restrictions in Section 868 prohibited products and rules promulgated by the Cannabis Control Board. And then a second recommendation as to whether the board should permit hemp or CBD to be converted to Delta 9 THC, and if so, how it should be regulated, and that the board should consult with the Agency of Agriculture. I didn't think we had enough testimony to move forward with the um, suggested amendments that were made yesterday, but I did think they were good ideas that should be further explored by the Cannabis Control Board. I would agree. All right. Any anyone else want to bring up any other ideas or thoughts that they would like to see incorporated into the bill? All right. I will keep an eye on um, on my email as best I can while I'm chairing a meeting during lunchtime. Um, so if you have any thoughts, please do reach out to me and Mr. Vice Chair as well. Um, and I will ask Lidge Council to get a draft um, to you via email and post it to our page as soon as possible. And it should look very familiar because we have now gone through all of the 
recommended changes. Any other questions before we sign off for a lunch break and floor? All right, let's sign off.